I'm Joe Bianca. I'm Bill Finley. I'm Jonathan Green. I'm Alan Carrasso. It is 9.08, Wednesday, October 7th. This is the TDN Writers Room presented by Keeneland. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm the associate editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News. Suddenly feeling very self-conscious about my Zoom background. Hi, I'm Bill Finley, a correspondent for the Thoroughbred Daily News. You can also catch me on Sirius XM Radio every Saturday from 10 to 1 as I host the Down the Scratch Show on Channel 211. Jonathan Green, General Manager for DJ Stable, and I'm just happy to be part of the Joe Bianca Publicity Tour, stop number 82. Alan Carrasso, Managing Editor of the TDN, and I have had more hits than the Chicago Cubs did in their two-game <laughs> playoff run. Also, since I know you guys are so into the baseball and the basketball and the football going on, let me just say, number one pick, baby, Alexi Lafreniere. Can't wait until next year. Did they slip in that hockey. Did you get your personalized jersey yet? No, not yet. We don't know what number he's wearing yet. So there's gonna be a big reveal. Oh, but, yeah. It's it's on deck. Don't worry. Very nice. All right now, I know now I know what to get you for uh, for the holidays. TDN Writers Room is presented by Keeneland. Uh, Keeneland announced yesterday the uh, the November catalog. Three thousand seven hundred seventy seven horses are cataloged for the November breeding stock sale, which will go November 9th through November eighteenth. 1,832 broodmares and broodmare prospects, 1,404 weanlings, 531 horses of racing age, and 10 stallions have been cataloged. Keeneland's going to keep accepting supplemental entries for the premier book one and for the horses of racing age se uh, segment of the sale. Uh, COVID protocols are going to be very similar to the September sales and be online bidding options and all that. So if you can't make it for whatever reason, uh, that you're encouraged to bid through their online portals. Seems to have been going well through the September sale. Um, so it's super exciting for Keeneland November, which will happen right after the Breeders' Cup. So I'm sure there's going to be lots of top offerings with updates in the catalog. So we'll look forward to that. All right, so huge, huge weekend of racing. It really was, you know, kind of a, a smorgasbord all across. We had the we had the Keeneland races, we had the Belmont races, we obviously had the Preakness. Uh, I want to give a shout out to everybody at the TDN who really worked hard this weekend, especially the people that worked on Saturday. I think there were 17 graded stakes on Saturday, so very tough weekend for everybody in the office, but also a very fun weekend because there was a, so much great racing. We we'll start at the top with the Preakness, obviously. Um, I said this on Twitter on Saturday and then did not bet her. I, I was very shocked at how little money Swiss Guide ever was taking. I thought she would be third choice. I thought she'd be five or six to one. Shocked a thousand words was half the price she was. A max player was a few points lower than her on the on the tote board, which is shocking to me. Uh, wish I could make fun of Brian this week for for max player, talking about max player yet again. But um, she, she was just always a more likely winner than him. But, you know, I didn't know that she had that kind of race in her. I knew she was a really nice filly. I knew she was at or near the top of her class in terms of the three-year-old fillies. But to run that race, to hit that hole that early, which was a pretty narrow opening on the turn, um, it was a good move by Robbie Alvarado. But I think she really took him there. I think that she was she was willing and eager to go through that hole. To do that and then hook up with the Derby winner at the top of the stretch, stride for stride the entire way. And I don't know about you guys, but I felt like for most of that final furlong, he was not going to go by her. You just you watch enough races and you see these inside horses digging in, and it just the, the outside horses horse never seems to go by. That was the feeling I got. Was not surprised that she hung on with the way she was fighting. Um, but obviously, the story is is Kemic Peak willing to take to take that step outside the box, try the Philly against the boys. He thought about it going into the Derby, decided to stick with the Oaks. She ran second in there. Uh, we're going to talk to Ken a little bit later about the decision making process. But good on him for for being bold and doing something different. There's there's very few guys I feel like in racing in America that are willing to do that. Wesley Ward is one of them. There's just there's, there's few guys, and and he deserves a lot of credit for that. Also deserves, deserves a lot of credit for potentially getting Horse of the Year out of a thirty-five thousand dollar Keeneland September grad. So that deserves a lot of credit. I think Authentic also ran a really good race. I, he's continues to be a horse that everybody sells short. I mean, even even three to two, I felt like was a little high for the for the Derby winner. But he covered more ground than she did. He did get away with with that slow pace, twenty-four and forty-eight for the opening quarter mile. 
my impression was that Art Collector got a poor ride and should have been on the lead. Didn't get away all that great. Um, this isn't just bitterness because Art Collector cost me the contest. But I thought that kind of pace, he had opportunities to split horses early on. And I just thought it was a very passive ride for a horse who can click off 23, 46, 110 and keep going. So those are my first impressions. Sure, I'll have more after you guys speak on it. Let's throw it to Bill. Well, she really was the overlooked horse, as you said, 11 to 1. And if we roll back the tape, I'm not sure, did we even mention her when we did the writer's room uh, last week? If we did, it was just in passing. And here she's this wonderful horse that goes and win the pre wins the previous. Joe, I agree with everything you said, especially the part about Ken McPhee. And, you know, obviously, Swiss Skydiver was the story, but... So coming in a close second was Ken McPeak and how he's handled this horse, not just in the Preakness, but how he has done so all throughout the year where he keeps running her. He's not one of these guys. Oh, I got to give her eight weeks off in between races. I can't take a chance. I got to find the race where I'm going to be three to five. I mean, to me, honestly, it didn't make a whole lot of sense to go into the Preakness. She had tried boys once. She had already lost against our collector in the bluegrass. It was a good race, but she was clearly second best. She was coming off not one of her best races of the year in the Kentucky Oaks when she ran second to She Dares the Devil. But McPeak has this confidence in this horse. He has this confidence in himself. And he's not afraid to try things that, like you said, there are only a handful of trainers in this sport would ever dare try. And I'm not sure anybody is as aggressive as him, as him right now with high level horses. So it was a, to me, it was a feel good story. It was a remarkably entertaining, stirring stretch drive. You know, it was won by a female horse and it was won by a trainer who was willing to, you know, think outside the box and take some chances. You know, as they say, if you don't like this race, you don't like horse racing. Exactly right, Bill. And, and and it's amazing that Swiss Skydiver not only won the Preakness, but she was only the sixth filly in history to win the Preakness and really only the second filly in modern history. Um, the other ones were all in the early 1900s. Uh, the last filly that won the Preakness was Rachel Alexandra, who uh, beat Mind That Bird. And, you know, no offense to Mind That Bird, but I don't think anyone's going to confuse him with Secretariat. Um, this was a much tougher field, a much deeper field that Swiss Skydiver beat. And um, just to your point, Bill, um, because I know you do a lot of shows, so you're probably not even listening to what we're saying most of the time, but 24 minutes into last, uh, last week's podcast, um, yours truly actually said, and how about Swiss Skydiver? I mean, again, what, you know, I, I give uh, McPeak a lot of, um, you know, a lot of uh, credit because of his chutzpah for running the Philly in the Preakness when she probably would have been hands down the favorite, um, you know, in the Black Eyed Susan, which is also a huge race for your resume. So the fact that he's, you know, shifting her over to, to run against the boys in the Preakness, um, I think you have to give him and, and the connections uh, involved with Swiss Skydiver uh, a lot of credit. So, uh, you know, I'm interested to see how those two wild card horses run. Um, the wild card one being Thousand Words pre-race and, and the wild card two being can Swiss Skydiver, you know, win one of the classic races against the boys? You know, keep those fan mail, you know, and, and tweets and emails coming. I appreciate it because I'm the only non-handicapper on the show who actually picked the winner. You want any more time, Joe? No, Joe's trying to say something, but his mic is mute, so, muted, so he can't even. <laughs> I was saying, ahead, uh, I was saying it was amazing that you brought the timestamp. Oh, oh, I looked it up. Believe me, I knew I knew one of you guys was going to say, "Oh, nobody even mentioned it." So that's. <laughs> It was 2402 to be exact, Patty, if you want to go back and look at it. I think the okay, footage is lost, John. I'm sorry. <laughs> tip, of the, tip of the cap. Thank you, Mr. Carrasso. I appreciate it. On to you. Good job. I mean, she's, um, she's a Philly. I don't think I could have had. Just from, uh, I mean, it was hard to figure out exactly what kind of trip she was going to sit with Thousand Words and Authentic and New York Traffic. They were going to fuel the pace and and her best chance was going to be to take back off of those and then make a run. Now, um, I'm of the opinion that oftentimes, or most times, jockeys get too much credit for, not enough credit for a bad ride, too much credit for a good ride. I don't know what I'm trying to say, but Robbie Alvarado in that spot, I mean, the pressure was on out of all the jockeys that Ken McPeak could have gone for. You went for Robbie Alvarado who's got the Preakness experience under his belt, having one with Curlin in, in 07. But that ride was, um, I don't think you can, I don't think you can praise that ride enough. 
I mean, these are split second decisions that have to be made. And when thousand words began to drop out of it at the half mile pole, Robbie took the bull by the, by the horns, said, I'm, I'm going to either win or lose the race right now. Gambled, made the lead. Even still, um, of course, this race harkens back to Rags, to Riches, and Curlin in, in 2007 Belmont. Rags was on the outside, Curlin was on the inside. For a filly to be buried down inside of an imposing male horse like Authentic um, and to box on and to win that battle, that was extraordinary. It was a really extraordinary battle. And I said on Twitter, I think this performance was every bit as good under different circumstances as Rachel Alexander was uh, 13 years ago. So, um, you know, hats off to Robbie, hats off to McPeak, and hats off to a really, really good film. That's a little blasphemous to me. I just am such a big Rachel Alexandra fan. I think you know it's, it was de- yeah. I agree that this was this was a tougher field, but it was also earlier in her three year old year as well. Um, but yeah, I mean they're they're both terrific fillies. We'll see what Swiss Scott ever goes on to do. I agree with what Bill said that this is this is what racing is supposed to be. You know, we've had so much negative press uh, in racing the last couple of years, and justifiably so. Like the, the situation at Santa Anita was horrible. The drug situation earlier this year. You know, there's there's just been so much such a bad cloud hanging over racing for such a long time. To have this on a national broadcast, this kind of race, a Philly taking on the boys, a heart pounding stretch battle like this. If we could bottle this and then just have this kind of vibe shown to the rest of the, the, the world, all the casual fans, I think racing would do okay. So I, I want to I want to give a hat tip to all the connections and the two horses who really gave us a show on Saturday. Um, before we move on to the rest of the weekend, you got to give Al his props. Came from behind. It seemed to be a, a two-man race between me and Brian, but Al came from behind much, pretty much all, all thanks to Authentic, um, who ended up winning the Derby got second in the Preakness, got Al the victory. Our collector, my only hope, could only manage fourth after the ride I got. Um, so, Al, hats off to you on that. Not literally well hats off to Carrasso. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Well done. So, if we can get, like, a virtual crown put on Al's head. <laughs> Otherwise, what are we paying you people for? Dunce cap. Uh, <laughs> Dunce cap. It's more appropriate. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the ride that, that John Velasquez gave, I thought was a little interesting too, because he really, he really took it to him in, in the, in the Derby and went 22 and four and 46 for him to be kind of taken back a little bit off of the 24 and 48 quarter mile, I thought was a little interesting. I think part of the reason was that he saw a thousand words to his inside and he didn't want to look like a jerk getting the two Baffert horses into a speed duel. So I think that that was one of the things he was worried about. But it was an interestingly run race. It wasn't – I don't think anybody I, – I, I think, we're, first, first of all, we were both – we were wrong about both – or at least I was – about the pace scenarios in both the Derby and the Preakness. So the Derby pace would be slower, but the Preakness pace would be faster. But it was, it was a weirdly run race. It was kind of run more like a turf race with a lot of grabbing and maneuvering um, than, than, than a typical dirt race, especially a classic dirt race. Uh, but yeah, those that, that's those are basically my impressions from the race. Anything else you guys wanted to add? Well, why don't we look forward now? What is Ken McPeak going to do? So after he's had this uh, one big decision to make of uh, running or not running in the Preakness and also not running or running in the Kentucky Derby versus the Kentucky Oaks, she's now in the picture for the Breeders' Cup Classic. So do you go with the safer choice, the Breeders' Cup distaff? Well, by the way, she will not be favored. I can't imagine we'll make her favorite over Mon White Girl. Um, you, you know, she got a lot of money from people who saw her in the Preakness and everything. But, you know, the smart handicapper is going to look at Mon White Girl, uh, despite the back meter and all John has had to say about her this year um, as, as the horse to beat in the Breeders' Cup distaff. Um, you know, I talked to Kenny after the race, and we can also address it to him when he comes on later uh, in the Green Group Guest of the Week segment. Um, but he dropped a hint about uh, that he may go in the Classic when he said, I like the mile and a quarter. So the classic is a mile and a quarter. The distaff is a mile and eight. You know, my two cents doesn't really matter. I wouldn't run her in the classic. I think it's too hard a spot. I'd run her in the Breeders' Cup distaff. But McPeak hasn't made many wrong decisions with this horse at all. Hey, how about the, just the season, her body of work this year from Tampa to Gulfstream Fairgrounds, Oakland, Santa Anita, Saratoga, Pimlico. What a phenomenal campaign. And, I mean, you know, forget about female champion forget about three-year-old philly champion 
I mean, she's, you know, she's got a chance at, at overall worst of the year. I mean, if everything shook out the right way, if she were to win the classic and, and all of that. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't, you know, what's funny about her to me is that I decided after the bluegrass, after she was pretty convincingly defeated by our collector, that she really didn't want any part of nine and a half or 10 furlongs. And she proved that way wrong in the Alabama. And then, um, you know, the way that she fought through the wire at Pimlico is, um, is further evidence for that. So I think they've got a live chance, no matter what. I agree with you, Bill. If she goes in, in the distaff, I think she's second favorite. But I mean, I, I think the consensus opinion is that Authentic is a top four chance for the British Cup Classic. And she beat him on the square. I mean, listen, stranger things have happened. I honestly think that she, she it, it's an interesting situation because in a normal year where the, the distaffers weren't so highly regarded, I would say she definitely has to go in the classic, but I don't know. It depends on who wins the classic. We have such a highly regarded, I mean, less so now that Midnight Bizu's retired, but still like a, a pretty, pretty powerful group of distaffers, both three-year-old and older. If she, if she wins that race and someone other than say improbable, maybe times they tire tis the law wins the classic then she might just have just as good of a chance as if she ran third or fourth in the classic um so it's it's, it's going to be an interesting decision for him to make uh but i i'm not sure that she shouldn't be favored over modern white girl i mean i i don't i haven't seen anything that really wows me from modern white girl this year and john will be happy about that he's no, no longer on an island like she's definitely run well she won a grade one race so i'm not taking anything away from her but has she really blown you away with anything she's done this year and not i mean not not in my estimation so i'm not sure that 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 modern white girl should definitely be a, a significant favorite over swiss skydiver if that's where they both end up but she definitely i feel like she definitely has work to do you know, in terms of the horse of the year trophy, I think she would have a much better case if she had won the Oaks running second in the Oaks. I think, especially to a long shot, like she dares the devil who came back and did not run well the other day in the spinster. I mean, she ran okay. She, she was third, but didn't, didn't think that she had any real excuse not to win that race at, at six to five with midnight Bizu out. I think, <laughs> I mean, I, I just think she has work to do, but she's definitely at least in the conversation. And I'm, I'm interested to ask Kenny about what what he th what more he thinks she has to do to win Horse of the Year. But here we go, second straight year where heading into the Breeders' Cup, Horse of the Year is, is kind of up for grabs. Um, but I think, you know, with all due respect to Bricks and Mortar, I think this year it's going to be, you know, a little bit more satisfying to have a horse like Improbable or Swiss Skydiver, it is the law who had this this sustained excellent campaign against the top levels of American dirt horses. I think it's going to be a little more satisfying, but we'll see what happens. There's lots of other great racing from last weekend to get to. It was a big day at Keeneland, um, big day of undercard races at, at, at Pimlico. Uh, Keeneland, the, the headline race was the um, Chadwell Mile and gave out Ivar on, at 14 to one on Twitter. You're all welcome. I actually did bet that one. I didn't bet Swiss skydiver. Got a piece of Ivar though. Didn't, didn't go up, go exactly how I thought. I thought he'd be wire to wire, easy, easy lead, but came from off the pace. He's a really interesting horse going forward because he's lightly raced. He's a group one winner in Brazil. He's only run six or seven times um, for uh Paolo Lobo, who can get a who can get a good horse. I remember Pico Central was really good for him. He's had some of those South American imports who have run well in the past, usually on the West Coast. But he's a very interesting horse. And and with Mo Forza's performance in the City of Hope Mile, I think for the second straight year, the, the Breeders' Cup Mile is going to be one of the most interesting, you know, high powered real battles of the Breeders' Cup World Championships. I'm, I'm really looking forward to that race. Uni's back. It was good to see Uni get back to the winner's circle in, in the uh, first lady. I thought her races this year had been pretty subpar, especially for her. Um, so it was good to see her get, get back on track. We had some, we had some good two-year-old racing, simply ravishing big weekend for McPeak. So we'll ask about, about her as well. Grade one winner for Lao band. So another son of uncle Mo off to a really good start at stud. Um, Muta Sabek, who's a TDN rising star ran really well in the bourbon um, we had essential quality in the Breeders' Futurity. So a lot of good to your racing. Plum Ali and the Miss Gorilla over at Belmont. That was a really good performance. She's three for three now for Christophe Clement. I got to think she's going to be one of the favorites for the Juvenile Phillies turf. Um, complexity, my man, complexity. I remember at the end of last year, we did our segment where we were talking about 
what horses other than the three-year-olds we were looking forward to running in 2020 and complexity was mine he immediately proved me wrong when he went out to california and ran terribly in the malibu so he took a while to come along but he ran a 110 buyer beat code of honor on the square and the kelso i think he has the talent to be probably the best one turn horse in the country if he can keep it together obviously that's a big if but when he's right especially now as he's getting better as he's getting older i think he has a chance to be really really good um going seven furlongs to a mile um on the preakness undercard factor this ran a 110 buyer and winning the dinner party stakes which used to be the dixie went wire to wire um that's the highest turf buyer i've seen i think since flincher i don't remember a 110 plus buyer for an american turf horse um we also had channel maker and the Joel Hirsch who got a 108 not to be sneezed at he's a he's a crazy horse because he's getting better it seems going into his nine-year-old year he was he had some good races that he ran in the past but he was kind of an in and outer but now he's now he's strung together back to back really impressive grade one victories going to be interesting to see what happens in the Breeders' Cup he's in the past had really big races in the Joe Hirsch and then just completely bombed in the Breeders' Cup like run beating 30 lengths so it's going to be interesting to see if he's any better this year. at Keeneland doesn't have to ship all the way to California. Um, those are just some of the first ones that jumped out at me. I'll pass it to Bill and the rest of you guys on what you saw beyond the Preakness from this weekend. I want to give a shout out to two other horses uh, that were not the main headliners, but are, are worth mentioning. First of all, congratulations to our good friend, John Green, who's DJ Stable and Empire Racing Club combined to win the uh, Toronto Cup with proven strategies. And Joey, you didn't mention the Jersey bread. Horologist wins the Bell Dame for all us Jersey guys. And after the race, Bill Mott said, uh, probably not Breeders' Cup because she's not uh, eligible. But I've talked to the owners and they are leaning towards running her in the distaff. Going to put up 160,000, they think. Uh, Dude, to in your breaking news banner above yeah. Bill's head. Right. Yeah, that's right. Um, Joe, of all the horses that you mentioned, um, I thought, you know, next to the Preakness, um, there, there were a lot of big stories, but I think Uni was the big, biggest story of them all because here she is a Breeders' Cup winner from last year, and she just wasn't good in her first two starts this year. Um, you know, obviously it's against males, but she's proven she can beat males before. She was seventh in the four-star day. She comes into the first lady. She's got to beat her stable mate. Uh, newspaper of record and you know uh, whatever was wrong with her or why she didn't run at her very best in those other races is no longer a factor she looked tremendous winning the first lady so now she's going to be very good in the breeders cup uh mile and um and just uh, bouncing around a little bit because uh, you know i don't want to comment on, on you know 10 races here but i also thought essential quality in the breeders to charity was very good and a very interesting horse and you know boy talk about having all the right connections brad cox by Tappet, owned by Godolphin. Uh, this horse wins the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. Then, obviously, you have the Kentucky Derby watch for Godolphin trying to win their first ever Kentucky Derby. So, uh, and also another one that, um, again, wasn't a real marquee race, but Frank's Rockette. Boy, she is She is a Rockette. Wins the Gallon Bloom easily, and she'll be going back in the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mayor Sprint, no doubt. But uh, just a wonderful weekend of racing. As you said, what, 17 graded races on one day alone? Amazing. 17 graded races, 12 domestic winning your ends, and five more graded stake races uh, in Paris, um, you know, including the ARC, which we didn't even talk about yet. But, um, Bill, that, that's a great scoop on horologists. You know, we're all Jersey guys, so it's nice to see the Jersey bred not only win outside of New Jersey, but with the possibility of, of running um, in the Breeders' Cup. So what you're saying is that there's a chance that she'll <laughs> run in the Breeders' Cup. Yeah. Yes, right. there is a very good chance. There's yes. a very good chance. As an homage to the owner, there's a chance stable. Um, anyway, oh, um, good, John. Thank you. That's why I'm here. I'm here to. I'm here to educate. I'm here. I thought. It, I actually thought you were channeling Dumb and Dumber, Jim Carrey, for a minute. That's that's that, yeah. equally apropos, right? Exactly. Exactly. Um, but let's let's stick. I mean, there are so many great races that you almost can hyperventilate talking about them all. Um, and you guys touched on, on the majority of them. But let me go back to the Shadwell turf mile for a second with Ibar, not only because of the way that that, uh, you know, that he won that race, but also, again, you see a pattern of three non American horses coming here and winning a grade one race and Ivar from Brazil, Raging Bull finished second from France and without parole, um, you know, from Great Britain, they finished one, two, three um, in the Shadwell turf, which was just a, a really fun race to watch because it was like a prototypical turf race. Everyone from the back end, um, pay, you know, came on in, in the last uh, quarter mile. Um, let's also shift gears to some of the two-year-olds because they're our future. 
Um, as Whitney Houston used to say, the children are our future. Well, the two-year-olds are our future. And you look at some of these races, the Pilgrim Stake, Fire at Will, um, not only went wire to wire, but listen to these fractions, Al, you'll appreciate it. 25 and 2, 50 and 1, 115. And you say, okay, well, Fire at Will obviously was going really slow in the front end. And then he finished up in 22 and three for his, for the, for the quarter from six furlongs to eight uh, to a mile. And the last eighth of a mile, he went in five and change. That's really picking it up. So that is a great tactic is, you know, when you get in front and you slow the pace down, so you have something left. So fire at will and, and Kendrick Carmuch did a great job um, in the pilgrim, the great two. And 16th then, of a mile. I'm sorry. 16th of a mile. But I said the eighth of the last eighth of a yeah. mile. Well, that was really fast for an eighth of a mile. I was like, going to say. Next, well, that's 16th of a mile in five and five. And four. That was, that was, that was really, really good. Um, so, so, you know, the Pilgrim winner, um, Fire Will and, and a couple of the horses from the, uh, from the Bourbon look like they're going to be taking on Gretzky the Great, who won the summer stake um, up in Canada early, earlier, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago. And then just a couple more, um, you know, Philly, excuse me, a couple more two year old races with the Claiborne Breeder, Breeders Futurity. Um, essential quality. Again, you mentioned Godolphin across the board, owner breeder. Um, looks like that one is, is a, a rising star. And then simply ravishing. And we're going to talk to Kenny McPeak later on about the Alcibiades winner. But how about his sire, Leoban, or her sire, excuse me, Leoban, um, in New York, son of Uncle Mo, and didn't really get a lot of fanfare. And all of a sudden has um, the Darley Alcibiades winner. And then also had um, Keep Me in Mind who finished second in the grade one futurity also. So in his first crop had two really, really good horses, um, you know, that are coming into form and possibly running in the Breeders' Cup. So, you know, you can get these regionally bred horses, um, you know, or, or horses from regional sires that look like they can hit the board and do well in the toughest top competition. So in a weekend of top, top racing, um, there are just so many stories to talk about. And again, we haven't even touched um, what happened outside of the uh, United States borders. Um, but there was some great racing there as well. I just want to uh, give a couple more shout outs to a couple of what I thought were really um, heady rides in addition to Robbie's in, in the Preakness. Um, I thought the ride that Rosario put on Uni in the First Lady was outstanding. I mean, she's not typically as handy a, as she was over the weekend, but probably knew that he had to have her closer and knew that in Uni, he had a horse with a far superior turn of foot than newspaper of record. So when he had Uni within a length or two lengths of, of the stable mate turning for home, I, you know, if there were in-running betting there, I would have invested everything I had on, on Uni to, to outkick newspaper of record and that, and that she did. And Bo Recall is, um, you know, Bo Recall is a, a nice uh, distaff miler as well. So, and then I thought the ride that, um, that Junior Alvarado put on Horologist in the Bell Dame was really, really crafty. I, uh, they, they pinged the gates with her. They, they asked her to lead, and you had a horse inside of her like Latrushka, whose all speed ran a, a really great race last time, ran them off their feet at Saratoga. And by sending Horologist into the lead for even just a stride or two, it made Carmouche get aggressive on, on Latrushka which Carmouche is, is an aggressive rider to begin with, but he really had to put her into the bridle. And then she got aggressive, went 45 and change and 109 flat. And that was never gonna, that was never gonna sustain. And, um, and then he had horologist nearest to her, got the first run and uh, Dunbar Road and, and Point of Honor had no chance. So those were two really good efforts. I just wanna give a shout out to Yapon who won the Chick Lang earlier in the week. Uh, I think he's a live chance in what's become a pretty diluted uh, or diluted Breeders' Cup sprint. Um, and then I, I'm going to give a look. I thought there were some sneaky performances in defeat, one of which was Raging Bull. Um, you know, he's he's proven himself a, as a Grade One quality miler and hasn't gotten hasn't gotten it done in his last few, but proved in out in California that that he can run with these horses. And if it falls right, you're going to get a Chad Brown horse at. 10 or 12 to one in the Breeders' Cup. And I think he's pretty live. I agree with uh, what Al said about her, about Horologist and Junior Alvarado. Listen, for my money, Junior Alvarado is pound for pound, one of the best riders in the country. He's a little bit streaky, but turf, dirt, I think that was an extremely smart ride 
You also, in, in, in addition to forcing Kendrick to go with that fast, going to the lead, first of all, and then taking back, you also had every idea of where Dunbar, Dunbar Road and the horses behind him were at all, the, at, all, at all times, made an early move, proved to be right, and opened up, and, and the rest of them couldn't catch her. I think Dunbar Road was a little bit overrated, but uh, I thought that was – I also agree with Al that that was a, a brilliant ride by, by Junior um, in the Bell Dame. Also, something that Al mentioned last week about sons of sons of Uncle Mo. If you look at the uh, the top earning first crop sires, not this time is number one. Numbers two, three, and four are all sons of Uncle Mo: Nyquist, Outwork, and now Lauban. So, I think that's that's definitely something to, to look at in the future. Is the sons of Uncle Mo if he starts to become this truly great sire of sires? Early indications are that he will be. Um, but yeah, lots, so many great performances, such a great weekend of racing, really kind of the last, we have, we have some races this weekend that I'll get to, but really kind of the last big prep weekend before we get to the Breeders' Cup. So, um, the divisions are kind of interesting right now, horse of the year, not only horse of the year, but, uh, champion older Philly. I don't think Monomoy girl has, has that locked up yet. You know, Midnight Bizu had such a great year. She's going to, she's going to suffer from missing the second half of the year. Um, so, so I think that that's still open, um, three-year-old Philly, I think Swiss skydiver probably has it locked up now beating the boys. Um, but we'll see what happens in the distaff, uh, three-year-old male still not completely decided. I think, you know, authentic that head loss had a lot of people, had a lot of people in the tis, the law camp breathing a sigh of relief. So I think if authentic had won the preakness, he would have stuck his nose ahead of tis, the law in the three-year-old race. But I think tis, the law is still the leader, but it's going to, that's going to depend on the breeders cup classic. Um, but yeah, really a lot, a lot of wide open divisions, especially the really interesting ones going into the breeders cup. And we'll talk more about it in the weeks leading up. Um, I just want to get to this, this weekend at Belmont. Belmont has the, the stage this weekend in terms of Breeders' Cup winning year-end races. That was mostly Keeneland last week, but this week the Belmont on Saturday. Belmont on Saturday has four Grade One races, all are winning year-ends for the um, for their respective Breeders' Cup divisions. They have the, we have the Champagne should get another should get a rematch between Jackie's Warrior and Reinvestment Risk. That should be pretty interesting. Um, Muda Sabek, who was third in the hopeful, flattered the the hopeful result by winning, albeit on turf in the Bourbon and the Flower Bowl, Frazette in the uh, Jockey Club Gold Cup this Saturday at Belmont. We also have the QE2 at Keeneland for three-year-old fillies. I believe it's the last top-level race for only three-year-old fillies uh, on grass. And then Sunday at Belmont, we have the Futurity on turf, which is a winning year in for the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf Sprint, also the Matron. And then Monday at Belmont on Columbus Day, we have the Hill Prince and the Knickerbocker. So the action is going to be centered on Belmont this week after Keeneland took the, the, the spotlight last weekend. Um, but still some good racing to look forward to. But I think, you know, after this weekend, we'll have a, a good idea of where we stand in terms of the fields and the divisional races heading into the Breeders' Cup. So hope everybody enjoyed all of that racing this weekend. Again, tip, tip of the hat to everybody at TDN for all their work and putting out great product th this weekend as we usually do. Um, and we're looking forward to the Breeders' Cup now with, with both eyes, with, uh, with the Triple Crown now in the rear view. Joe, can I just add one more thing? I, I actually have a question for Al. Al, what did you think of the arc? Uh, you know, I thought the winner was was very good. I mean, the ground was um, was obviously a factor. It was always going to be. Um, just, you know, for frame of reference, they went 231 last year, I think, and Satsas won this year in 239. So, um, you know, it was truly testing bottomless kind of ground. I mean, it's not sass. He sat the trip in behind and came out and, and, you know, had dead aim on them and, and did what he had to do. Um, you know, I think the ground was, was going to be problematic for Enable and, and she struggled in, in the last 300 or so. Um, you know, Stradivarius, like I told you, John, I thought, I thought the ground could bring Stradivarius into it, but he was there in tight, um, with a quarter mile and 300 meters to, to race and just never really let down. So, um, but a great result for, um, for the French, you know, it's um, sometimes it's hard for them to make an impact with, um, with all the horses coming in, Aiden O'Brien's who obviously had to, had to come out because of the, the positive controversy. Um, so, you know, it got a bit watered down, but, you know, for the French to run, uh, the top four, I think maybe the top five, even that's, you know, that's a great result for, uh, for French racing. And then, um, 
In addition to Peter Brandt winning, the, um, the Jacksons also won the Prix de la Forêt for the third year in a row with a filly called One Master, uh, Fastnet Rock, six-year-old, I think. And uh, she could come for, for the mile, actually. Uh, that seven for a long race translates well to the uh, Breeders' Cup mile. But um, yeah, always, you know, it's our weekend. It's always fun. And uh, and now South Sass is off to second career. Bad job by me, not not bringing up the arc, but that's why we're a team, John. That's why we're a team. No, and, and the only reason I bring it up is when Bill and I interviewed Peter Brandt, you know, it seems like eons ago, that was like his main focal point was, yeah, it'd be really, and I'm paraphrasing, and Bill, correct me if I'm wrong, but he was like, it'd be really nice to win a triple crown race, but I really want to focus my attention on the arc. I mean, that, that was something that he actually stated. I don't I don't have a time mark, like, you know, when I pick Swiss Skydiver, but but um, I, I do remember distinctly him, him saying that that was like his big goal in his racing career was to to win that race and give a shout out to I'm sorry, sorry. I want to shout out kelsey too because we last week when we had kelsey on we asked asked her i asked her about horses that had chances at a price and sats was one of the ones um that she mentioned go ahead bill yeah i just want to add to the peter brand story is so remarkable i mean what, what was it 20 years or so he was out of the game then he comes back and his sky's just unstoppable and you know what he's doing in the U.S. and so much has to do with Chad Brown and, and the power there. But, uh, you know, to show that he's a force all over the world and wins the Arc de Triomphe, um, you know, I don't know what kind of percentages there are, but I mean, it seems like he wins 65, 70 percent of his starts and they're all great one stakes horses. So, uh, you know, Peter Brandt's comeback has been one of the more remarkable stories in racing over the last several years. And uh, I mean, the guy's just unstoppable. Yeah. Um, and any other thoughts from the from the card, Al? This would be a shameless plug, but I, I did watch the opera, which is the older fillies and mares going 2,000 meters. And um, I, this will appeal to no one at all, but I follow racing from small, small places. There was a Polish filly in there called Inter Royal Lady. who She won the Polish Derby, beat the boys, and she's 10 for 11 at home. And, and they brought her to, to try the opera for her first start overseas. And she ran... Um, like she was never going to be in it, but she got beat about six lengths, which is um, a really tremendous result for for uh, for Poland. But um, but you never know. You never know who's going to. We have we have listeners all over the world. Honestly, good so. horse, yeah, good horses and good listeners come from anywhere. That, that's right. There are no small racetracks. There are only small minds. <laughs> Al is the king of the, of those of those kind of races. He's, the small if minds. If you want to know, if you if if you're handicapping the yeah. Kazakhstani Derby, like hit up <laughs> Al, he'll ha he'll have the tips for you. Uh, how about the fact that there were so many great races? We didn't even talk about the Black Eyed Susan. Is that, that a great race? A good race. But it's a great two. I know it's not. It's not even a considered. It's not considered a great one anymore. Or or Gufo, who won actually rather impressively in the Belmont Derby, which is a great one. Um, but yep. like, we we ran out of time before we ran out of top yeah. races this weekend. That was awesome. It, it's what we've all been striving for and praying for you know, during this whole situation with COVID. And Bonnie South, Bonnie South ran a giant race in, in the Black Eyed Susan. And she got so far back, pace was on, but to get that far back, and then she was really trucking home late. Uh, no idea what their plans are for her, but um, but she's, you know, good Philly ran second in the Alabama. So she's, you know, she's quality. Just a little housekeeping on the arc. Enable did come out of the race well, according to John Gazin. There are not plans yet for her future. Um, she's going to be seven next year. So uh, always questionable whether or not those, those older mares can keep it together for that long. We'll be, we'll be inclined to give her the excuse of the heavy ground, but uh, we'll see if we see her again. Hopefully that's the case. We'll be right back after this message from Keeneland.
Owning multiple graded stakes winning racehorses like Hard Not to Love and Decorated Invader is attainable with a racing partnership like West Point Thoroughbreds. Partnerships enable you to spread your ownership across several horses for less than it costs to own one horse alone. This increases your racetrack action and chances for a big horse. Learn more about, about why West Point Thoroughbreds is the gold standard in racing partnerships at westpointtv.com. Um, so Bill did some reporting on this last week about Calder. The end, the end of an era at Calder as Gulfstream is soon going to take over the entire racing calendar. We, the writing was on the wall for that. Once Gulfstream turned Calder into Gulfstream West and knocked down the grandstand, um, we knew that that, that racing at Calder was, was going to be n- not long for the future. Um, it's, it's served as, as a stabling place for a lot of people at Gulfstream for a long time. Um, but the, the, the racing future is non-existent for Calder. I mean, this was a really popular story on our site, and I think it's a track that a lot of people, especially in South Florida, have a pretty strong connection to. Um, I've, I've never been there, but my my connection to it was when I was first getting into racing. It was nice to have a track on, like, Mondays and Tuesdays to bet that had, like, a really nice turf course. I always remember those giant monsoons coming through and, and wiping out the card in, like, 10 minutes. Um, so that, that that was a quirk. That you had to be prepared for but i was like i always liked racing at calder it was it was kind of a shame that that you know that was the miami track you know if you go down to florida set gulf stream is a little bit north of miami it doesn't it's it's kind of tangentially connected to miami calder was the miami track and if you have if you have any stories or anything you want to say about calder you can email me um just my email is my name at gmail.com i'd be interested to hear from you because i'm a big fan of miami and uh and, and south florida i think has a, has a once hialeah closed you know calder and Gulfstream were the only ones last left standing and now it's just Gulfstream. so let me know if you have any stories or anything you want to say about calder i think the 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 broader thing to talk about here i'll, I'll throw it to bill after this is what happens when churchill downs buys racetracks and i remember not too long ago maybe like a decade ago Churchill had Hollywood Park, Arlington Park, Calder, Churchill, Hoosier Park. They had like six or seven tracks that mostly seemed to be doing pretty well. And now look at where we are. They pretty much only have Churchill left. Hollywood is gone. Calder's gone. Arlington is on the way to being gone. And I just, I think you you can't help but put two and two together that when a, a, a corporation that has very little interest in buying racetracks and really just wants them for what for being tied to the to the gambling license you're not going to have those racetracks for very long in the future and i think that's an unfortunate thing because churchill downs itself is an iconic racetrack and and for that company to kind of you know pull up anchor and 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 get rid of these other tracks and just kind of let them go by the wayside um so they can have their just so they can have their casinos uh i'll toss it to bill i think that's a that's a pretty depressing development for racing but he probably knows more about it than i do yeah, but Joey, thank you. And the story was well received, but it's not because I uh, broke any ground or you know got a huge scoop. Um, everybody pretty much knew this was going to be the last meet ever at Gulfstream West slash Calder. And just to give a little background, in Florida, as in most states, if you have a casino and horse racing, you have to have some sort of racing meet in order to have a casino license. So that is really the only reason why Calder has stuck around these last several years. I'm sure they would have pulled the plug on Calder years ago if they could, but they needed to have 40 racing dates in order to keep the casino license. So they just said to Gulfstream, you guys run it, you know, we'll tear down the grandstand, we'll get out of here, we'll get out of your way, et cetera. So in a really pretty sneaky, but in some ways ingenious move, they built a highlight fontan at Calder. Then they went back to the state, the racing commission or whatever, there's no real racing commission, whatever the heck it's called, and said, hey, we now have highlight, it's pure mutual gambling, we don't need horse racing in order to continue. The, the st- uh, case was taken to the courts, the courts decided in their favor, they got the highlight, probably about four people show up and the handle on the entire highlight card is probably about $12, but they couldn't care less because it lets them have the casino. And now that's the reason why it's going to go. But I, I think the reason why the story resonated is exactly what you said. There's so much ill will in this industry towards Churchill Downs for the reasons you have said. And, you know, um, the Churchill Downs executives don't really ever address this. They're not media friendly. They don't come out. But you can tell by their actions. They're unapologetic. They're a gaming company. Gaming makes more money than horse racing. It's a better business. 
They are the, the people that run the corporation. Their job is to uh, please their stockholders to get that stock price up. And by getting rid of horse racing and going into gaming, they have accomplished that. I don't know what the figures are, but most people tell me that the Churchill stock, it just continues to go up and up and up every year. Is that right? No, it's not right by horse racing. It's something you wish they would have a little bit more of a sense of the importance of this game, the importance of their own racetrack in this sport, and just be better people. I mean, better stewards of the industry, but they're not, they're not going to change. They own one more racetrack, Joe, that you didn't mention, Fairgrounds, but they have a casino there. As long as they have the casino and everything's percolating, uh, they'll keep going. But, you know, to them, it's all about the slot machines. It's all about the casino, and horse racing is clearly a nuisance that they want to have nothing to do with uh, other than the Kentucky Derby Day, Kentucky Oaks Day. And, uh, you know, that's really about it. You know, having raced at Calder, having gone to sales at Calder, um, you know, a piece of me is is kind of going to the wayside with this racetrack. Um, that being said, we talk all the time about field size and whether or not racetracks are viable and why do we have six racetracks in a 50 mile radius in, in our neck of the woods. Um, and I think, unfortunately, this is just the evolution of the business. And the fact that a publicly traded company owns the racetrack um, was really the death knell from, from the beginning. Because, Bill, as you mentioned, that's all they're focused on is the, is the share price and, and making sure they have a better quarter than the previous quarter and making sure that, that uh, they're making business decisions um, that tie to the bottom line to the stock price. That being said, this is kind of the natural evolution of, of, of this business is that we need to you know, get rid of some stallions that, that aren't doing well. We need to get rid of some sales dates that maybe don't, don't uh, have any interest to the general public anymore. And unfortunately, some racetracks are, 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 you know, have to fall into this category as well. Um, is it disturbing and, and saddening? Absolutely. But is it going to hopefully make the business stronger because every year we have less and less fall crops and we have less and less racehorses coming to the track? And do they really need to be running on a Monday or Tuesday at Calder? Um, I, I don't think so. I think that's what we're all kind of calling for. Um, but from a nostalgic standpoint, yeah, this stinks. This, this is really kind of a, a, you know, a crappy way to, to, to end a very graceful meet um, that I have very fond memories of you know, showing up in my, in my suit and my tie um, you know, for an afternoon of racing. And that was kind of the, the natural fare of, of, of uh, you know, the people who were there and, and what you went to go see. It was, it, it was, again, not to wax poetically, but it was kind of like a Saratoga-esque meet um you know when 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 it was really going strong and and everyone who was anyone from miami would come to the calder meet because it was just a fun place to be seen um but that's the way i'll remember it not the high lie slash hybrid you know um kind of casino racino that we have right now i'll remember it for the way it was um you know when we used to run in, in races and it was a fun place to be Joining a West Point Thoroughbreds partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high-class horses and stakes action for a fraction of the cost of trying to do it on your own. Learn more at westpointtv.com. We'll be right back after this message from West Point Thoroughbreds. of the week is sponsored by the green group an accounting tax consulting and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry with over 500 clients in the horse business they have proven strategies to save you taxes learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com so our green group guest of the week this week is the man of the hour the man who our producer patty wolf just said save sports this year by entering a Swiss skydiver in the Preakness. I don't know how much hyperbole that is because that was that was a hell of a race and a real great moment ken mcpeak thanks for joining us no problem. My pleasure. All right, Kenny. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to put your analyst hat on. We were talking about the horse of the year race earlier in the show and Swiss skydiver certainly is in the conversation now as are a lot of horses. What do you think that she has to do the rest of the year to get that horse of the year crown? Well, I think she needs to run well in the breeders cup. Um, you know, where we, we haven't decided where we're going to run yet. We've still got some, uh, analyzing of who's going to be out there and possible uh, starters. But, um, you know, she's run all year. I don't know how 
if they call it horse of the year, she ran all year. So, so what else can you do? Um, I think it's, um, I think it'd be fitting, but, um, you know, she's just really solid and, and that's more credit to her than it is me. She kept telling us she wanted to go and, and, um, the schedule lined out really well for us over the course of the year. And, and the fact that she ran, you know, East coast, West coast, North, South, Midwest, um, she's entertained the racing world all year for all over the country. Hey, Kenny, it's Bill Finley, and thanks for joining us. And let's stay on this whole subject of the, now the big decision so far as whether you go to the Classic and, and, and just out. You said you want to have more time to evaluate the field. You want to look at the sheet, see how she's doing, et cetera. But as we speak, what are the pluses and minuses of each spot? Well, um, I like the mile and a quarter distance. I think she's, she's phenomenal the further she goes. But, um, but also know that the depth of the Classic is going to be a lot It'll be a lot deeper, the classic. So, um, you know, we've got to look at all that. I, from what I understand, Monomore Girl would be the favorite in the in the distaff if she if she uh, if we don't go. And then um, who all goes in the classic? I hadn't really haven't really sat down and studied it very hard at this stage. We're just happy to get her back here. She's actually out to the door here at the barn. If you wanted to see her, we can flip the phone here in a minute, but she, um, she needed to get back in routine and make sure all systems go. And she's eating like she always did. She finishes up every night. And, and Kenny, one of the other interesting parts of, of not only running against the boys and beating them in one of the triple crown races, um, was the fact that, that you ended up selecting Robbie Alvarado to ride the horse. And I know there's a story behind that because, you know, publicly you've said that he wasn't necessarily the top choice, but a couple of riders actually spun you, which blows my mind, um, you know, in, in hindsight. So you mentioned before uh, on, on, a, on a different interview that Robbie was there every day, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and he formed a bond with Swiss Skydiver. Just go into that a little bit about, about Robbie and, and how he ended up with the mount. Well, um, the, the full version is, is that Peter Callahan came to me and said, or we, we talk every day practically. And he said, what about getting a two race commitment from a jockey instead of kind of jumping around? And, and I said, I, I agree with you. I think it's a good idea. And, um, so we offered the two race commitment to, to Brian Hernandez, who is my regular rider and, um, a guy that I really entrust. And I think he fits her really well too, by the way. So we, we offered that to his agent. Initially, his agent couldn't accept it. And um, so we offered it to Tyler Gaffleone. So, um, okay, we'd like a two-race commitment. We'd like to think that if she runs well in the Oaks, we'll bring her back in the Preakness. Um, there was no other race discussed. Um, okay, so they accepted the two-race commitment. Um, and I told his agent all along, I said, look, I, I want Tiz Law to come out before I'm going to look at it seriously. I really felt like we need to eliminate at least some of the competition. And so when Tiz Law finally came out and he waited pretty long to decide to come out. Um, and I was working the Keeneland sale. And at one point I told his agent, I'm probably, I'm probably leaning towards the spinster, but that was before Tiz Law uh, decided not to run. Well, Tyler worked her on a Saturday no problem. Went really well. He came back the following Saturday, which was, we're supposed to enter on Monday. He worked her and Tyler and I came into this office that I'm sitting in here now. And he said, Oh my God, that's the best she's felt all year. Yeah. You know, let's go, let's do it. Okay, great. So I announced that we're going to run in the Preakness and Tyler was on board. Well, by maybe six o'clock that night, his agent tells us that he can't ride. And I'm like, well, look, you have, you've given us two race commitment. Oh, well, sorry. I got to ride for Chad Brown at Keeneland. I, I said, it's dishonorable. You can't do this. It's dishonorable. Um, I've been doing this 35 years and I've never had something like that happen. I still find it dishonorable. However, at that point, okay, I don't have a rider Saturday night. I probably, I slept about half as normal as I would have. I'm trying to figure out what am I going to do? Um, reached out to Mike Smith's agent. He said he was going to try to get off mounts to come ride, but he had already given calls away. All the riders are taken in New York. Most of them are taken to Keeneland. Um, Pimlico, everything had pretty much already been hashed out. And Robbie Alvarado has been breezing horses for me on a regular basis around the track. And I called him and I said, Robbie, here's the deal. If Mike Smith turns his, turns his mount down, 
I'm going to tell Peter Callahan, you're going to go to Baltimore, rob this Philly in the Preakness. And he says, I'm ready. All right. I said, but I need you to go with me. You're going to go with me. We're going to go up there. We're going to spend every day with her. You're going to get to know her. I mean, re really, it's like Johnny Unitas getting hurt before the Super Bowl and Earl Morrill guys come in and play. I mean, it, it, it just, it, it was one of those deals. Um, and you know what? It gives me goosebumps thinking that we pulled it off. And shame on Tyler Gaffleone and his agent. Really, shame on him. And um, it's just one of those things. I've never dealt with anything like that. But we pulled it off. And, and I guess you've got to take a negative sometimes and turn it into a positive. And Robbie needed the break. And Robbie was hungry. Robbie knows what to do. And uh, he de deserves to ride more horses than he's been riding. And um, I think he pretty well proved it. You put him on the big stage and he can handle it. Hey, Ken, Alan Carrasso, thanks for uh, the honor to have you on with us. Yeah, thank, thank you. Yeah, I just uh, I want to take you back to your evolution. Uh, 1994, Tejano Run wins the British Futurity and gives a run second for you in, in the, the Thunder Gulch and the Derby the following year. Mm -hmm. uh, you decided to take a break for a time from, from training. I think you put on an agent's hat for a while and, and then came back and you just – Talk about what went into that and you know, how, how has it been for you this second go around? Not that I need to ask. Really. Well, that was actually in 2005. And um, my mother was diagnosed terminal in April of 2005. And so um, you know, we had a really good 2001 and 2002. Um, it was a re real highlight of my career those seasons. But um, she had a, a complicated health issue she had something called PPMS, which is an aggressive version of multiple sclerosis. And um, I had a stepfather who was having trouble with the drink, with drinking. And um, somebody needed to rearrange her estate or arrange her estate planning, as well as get her doctors. So um, it was one of those periods where all of a sudden you start going, oh, where's a little perspective. I had a hundred and some odd horses spread out all over the country. Um, and I said, you know what? It's time to call time out. Um, I stepped back. I decided I was going to continue to race. I continued to manage the stable. I actually handled all the business aspects of it. And Helen Pitts ran as the, uh, the trainer during the end, or actually from the middle of 2005 to the first of 2006. And um, by the end of the year, I was able to get my mother's details organized and then I was back the next spring. And um, during the period I was down as a bloodstock agent, I bought Kerwin, I bought Einstein, I bought a list of a lot of really good horses during that period. Um, I do think that the core of my success is in the auctions. The, um, I don't think training, training horses I find relatively easy if you, if you keep it simple and you pay attention to details, finding a good horse is very difficult. And um, when, when Helen took over that group of horses, um, I told her, so you got a really good group here. Um, these aren't easy to replace. And when I came back, I jumped right back in. And, you know, it's like riding a bicycle. I knew how to do it. Finding good horses is difficult. I want to talk about another horse that you found that seems pretty good. Uh, Simply Ravishing, who won the Alcibiades on Friday. Um, adding to another to a great weekend for the McPeak stable. Um, she started on turf, one first out on grass, then one off the turf in the PG Johnson stakes. And now it seems like her uh, future is clearly on dirt. I've, I've noticed that you start two year olds a lot on the grass, especially going two turns, whether or not dirt or turf is in their future. Can you just talk about that evolution with her, whether or not she was planned to be a grass horse or whether or not you had in the back of your mind that she would be a dirt horse eventually? Well, I don't like running horses four and a half furlongs, five furlongs, five and a half furlongs, even six. I don't think um, it takes a real special horse that, or, or if you're going to win those races, you almost have to send away from there. And I think we spend as much time here working on the minds of horses as opposed to the bodies, because you have to teach them to rate and, and settle and handle adversity. Um, I take a lot of my young horses off the pace in their first start. I take, I'll, I'll actually tell the rider, look, break and then settle and, and find a pocket and a position and let that horse take a little dirt in its face, figure inside, outside, and then finish. So 
it hurts our first time starter numbers. But um, the first time out isn't what's important. What's important is, is how a horse develops. So running a horse long on the grass is a, is a pace type race where there's nothing forced. You simply get a horse in nice rhythm and you make a run. And a good horse will win here regardless. And the other thing about running in some of those grass races is, is that there isn't a, there aren't a lot of dirt options, to be honest with you. You go out there and the dirt uh, races for two-year-olds really doesn't exist. Um, the first ones typically run, run at Ellis Park. And then um, they might write one at Saratoga at the end of the meet. And it's got to be written at a mile and an eighth. And that race typically doesn't fill. I've seen it fill one time in 20-something years. So, um, so you really either have to go to the grass, you have to go to the one-turn mile, or you don't run at all. So um, I'd rather run in the distance race than the sprints. But did you, did you, well, sorry, I just, did you always have in mind that she might be a dirt horse down the road? Well, um, you know, pedigree wise, she's dirt. Uncle Mo, I don't particularly look at him as a turf stallion, but she has more than ready in the bottom line. And for me, that's hail to reason through Southern halo and halo. And most of the hail to reasons really like the grass. But, but a good horse will win over anything as long as you give them, um, you know, a, a maiden race is really just nothing more than a test drive most of the time for us. We're trying to figure out how much quality they have. And a good horse will win on the turf or the dirt, it doesn't really matter. So, Kenny, you've called Swiss Skydiver a throwback horse. And, you know, the campaign is something right out of the 1980s. We all know the numbers now. Nine starts in the year, nine different racetracks. It's run every month of the year but April. So why are you able to do this with your horses and do it with a top-level horse like her, whereas some trainers either can't or don't even want to try a schedule like that? Well, um, I think it goes back to when I was um, a claiming trainer, to be honest. Um, back then, I, I, I used to claim a lot of horses for Ray Cottrell. Um, and, we, and we had – you have to – you have to – I guess you could say – I don't know if I'd use the word nurse in between races – but the campaign, you, you're, you're more worried about bringing them into the race with more energy. You can't, you can't train those horses and pound on them and expect them to hold together. And you're trying to get consistent pattern of a start out of a horse. And um, in between races, we rel keep it relatively simple. It's a light maintenance work, another maintenance work. Sometimes you need to do more depending on how far the races are spread apart. Um, you know, we, we haven't injected a joint on her all year, all right? I mean, she the only race day medication has been a small shot of Lasix. And even then, I could run her without it. She's never had a breathing problem once. Um, it's a, she, she's gotten us there, but she's also shown the energy between races to say, let's go. Kenny, one of the questions that we ask uh, the trainers who come on here is if you could be the racing czar uh, for a day, what would you change? Would it be, you know, race day medications? Would it be better testing? Would it be, um, you know, more uniform, uh, you know, rules and regulations? What what would Kenny McPeak, Czar, Czar McPeak do if you could change something in racing? Uh, that's a pretty simple one. Um, I'd get everything in behind, out from behind these paywalls. Um, I think we need to make racing so it's easier to see. Um, I think fan, the fan base is going to die away, continue to, if we continue to make people jump through these paywalls. I mean, the only way, is if, if, we're, if we're, let's say I'm 17 years old and you're 21 and we want to watch a horse race, we literally can't do it unless I have a credit card to open an ADW account or my mother and father have a satellite TV or it happens to be on the, on the uh, cable system that my family has. And even then, it's not easy. And you're not going to get all the racetracks as easy and simple. Um, you know, th this game has to open itself up. There's an old analogy that I've used repeatedly about baseball. You know, the owner of the Reds back in the late 20s, early 30s, decided to put it on the radio. And he was highly criticized by the other league owners for putting it on the radio. They said he was going to kill baseball. So, so he, he said he didn't care. They, they threatened to take his franchise away if he put it on the radio. So he put it on the radio, and the next thing you know, they've quadrupled attendance in two or three seasons. Horse racing is keeping itself in the dark. 
You can't get it on a local radio station. You can't get it hardly on the internet. Now, there are tracks that get it. Don't get me wrong. There are tracks that get it. Keeneland gets it. Um, there's other tracks that stream on their websites. But you need to have one encompassing location where they can all be seen and heard without people having to fight through it. And, um, you know, real, in all honesty, the big three are really, they're very protective of their content. Well, that protection is actually a negative for the sport because they, they want to control content and they want to, you know, it's theirs and they don't want to let anybody have it. Well, shame on them until they figure out that they op- when they open it, it'll grow. And um, I've, I've been in this fight, as you know, horse races now. We've fought this. And um, they won't give us video or they charge us so much for the video we can't function. And um, we grow 7,000 new users a month even without the video, and yet we go to them and say, hey, let's figure a way, a symbiotic symbiotic relationship that we can work together so we can take all these new users and show them what we've got. They won't do it. They're worried about market share. Their market share would grow if they would own. Right. Excellent point. Al? I don't think it has anything to do with medication. I don't think it has anything to do with breakdowns. Yeah, I think um, I think that is part of racing that really hurts us. It hurts the horsemen, but it is part of racing. And medication rules should be aligned nationwide. And I think that anything they can do to do that, all the better. Ken, you touched upon uh, Curlin, and we've all seen what he's done in, in terms of shaping the breed since he's entered stud. Um, I think. Take Charge Lady, who you purchased for 175 as, as a yearling 20 years ago now at Phasic Tipton, Kentucky. Um, she's certainly done her part in shaping the breed and uh, will Take Charge, Take Charge Indy, uh, Take Charge Brandy, and the Dam of Omaha Beach. But, you know, when you reflect on that, having, having brought a filly like that through her career, great as she was as, as a race mare, how does it make you feel to see these mares go on and, and be as important brood mares as they become? No, it's great stuff. Um, Take Charge Lady was an extremely special filly to be around. I, I hate to tell you, but you forgot Harlan's Holiday because, you know, I, I, of course, um, I didn't train, train him his entire career, but I think we were responsible for developing him. And um, what a fantastic horse he's turned out as a stallion. And um, so anytime you walk, when I walk into an auction, I'm looking at the catalog page and say, well, you know, I hate to tell you, but I trained the third dam. (laughs) 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 Oh, damn it. I don't know if that's experience or old age. Right. (laughs) (laughs) All right. I got one last question for you, Kenny. Um, I kind of want to know what your, your view of racing and taking chances in racing, because I think U.S. racing in particular is plagued with a lot of really cautious trainers, don't want to run their horses unless everything's absolutely perfect and be able to pick their four or five spots a year. You're a guy who wants who is willing to run fillies against the boys, as we've seen. You've shipped to Royal Ascot, you shipped to Dubai. Why do you think that that's the way to approach training? Why do you think that it's better to be able to take a shot outside the box as opposed to the cautious approach that we see across racing? Well, I think there's an overemphasis on win percentage. And I think owners need to get over expecting a trainer to win at 20%, um, 25%. The um, the math on that works in a bad way for everybody. Racing secretaries, it frustrates them because the trainers won't enter their horses. Um, owners don't get to run as often, so they don't get as much uh, re- return in purse money if they don't run as often. Um, so there's a lot of dynamics there. I myself am more interested in the black type and when a horse is running for black type, that affects the breeders, whether it's the owner of the stallion or the owner of the mare. So it's, there, there's a lot of cases that I, I like running for the black type. I think that that's, that's in long-term residual value. So I put very little interest in my win percentage and more interest in depth developing horses to get them to that stakes level. And you know what? We, we have horses that don't make it, and those horses pull down our win percentage, but that's okay because we've given them a chance. And um, I don't know how do, you, how do you change other trainers' position on that. I have no idea. That's something that they've got to deal with, and everybody's got their style. And I suppose mine worked out last weekend. 
<laughs> Kenny, you can't thank you enough for all the insight and for the time and for running. Swiss Skydiver against the boys gave us all a thrill on Saturday. Congratulations. Appreciate the time, Kenny. You're welcome. Appreciate you having me. Thank you, Kenny. Thanks, man. Welcome to Breeders' Cup. Right. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. As this week's Green Group Guest of the Week, Ken McPeak, will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. Learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. We'll be right back after this message from The Green Group. The Green Group is widely recognized as the top-rated tax and accounting firm specializing in the horse business. Why do the top owners, breeders, pin hookers, and trainers trust the Green Group as their tax advisors? The difference is experience. Firm founder Len Green has over four decades of experience owning, breeding, and racing horses. First-hand knowledge gives Green Group clients proven tax and money-saving strategies. Visit the Green Group at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. So that's going to do it for this week's edition of the TDN Writers Room presented by Keeneland. Remember, the Keeneland November catalog is now online with 3,777 offerings. Keeneland November starts November 9th, two days after the Breeders' Cup World Championships at Keeneland. I want to thank Bill Finley, John Green, Alan Carrasso, our Green Group guest of the week, Ken McPeak, our producer, Patty Wolf, our editors, Aliyah LaRocca and Danny Seiper, and our production coordinator, Michelle Sabrino. Thanks so much for watching. Wear a mask. We'll see you next week.